A particle's position is given by the function x is equal to 20t minus 5t cubed, with x is in meters and t is in seconds. Part A. When is the particle's velocity zero? B. When is the acceleration zero? C. When is this acceleration negative or positive? And part D is to graph everything. Graph the position, graph the velocity, and graph the acceleration. Now, it doesn't say in the problem, but the whole point of graphing it is so that we can get an idea of looking at the graphs, how it makes sense when you know, the acceleration is positive and negative and what it, really, really, what it really means. Graphing things and looking at them is very important there. So for part A, or the first part, we are told that the position of the particle is a function of time. The x position is a function of time, and it's 20 times t minus 5 times t cubed. So literally this equation means I put in any number of time I want, 0 seconds in the future, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 seconds, stick the numbers in here, calculate, and it tells me how far away from the origin I am. Now remember, it's one dimensional motion. So if you get a positive number for x, it's to the right of the origin, the zero point. And if you get a negative number, then it's on the other side on the negative part of the number line. So that's the position. But the problem doesn't really ask us about the position. Part A says, when is the particle's velocity zero? We're not given the velocity. We are given the position. So the first thing is we have to find the velocity of this particle. And when I say the velocity, I mean a function for the velocity. So we know that the velocity of any particle is equal to the derivative of the position, dx dt. So the derivative of the position with respect to time. And that means I'm taking the time derivative, d dt, time derivative of this. So I put it in here, 20 times t minus 5 times t cubed. And then this time derivative operates on everything in there, and then out comes a new function called the velocity. So the derivative of 20 times t is just 20 because you know, the exponent 1 times 20 is this, and then t to the 0 power, which is 1, so it disappears. And then you have minus, uh, and then 3 times 5 is 15, and then you have t squared. So we multiply these to get the 15. The exponent is reduced by 1. So we have 20 minus 15 t squared. So this, uh, more accurately, I'll say that this is a velocity as a function of time. So just like I can put any time I want, and I know the position of the particle, I can put any uh, any, velo any time in the future, and this will tell me the velocity of this particle. So for instance, at zero seconds, when the experiment starts at zero seconds, this goes away, and I'm actually traveling already at the beginning of the experiment with a velocity of 20 meters per second at time zero. So at that equation tells us at any point in the future what the velocity of the particle is. But we're asked, when is the particle's velocity zero? So that means I just have to put a zero in here and then calculate the time, or the times, uh, that, the, uh, that the particle has a velocity of zero. So I just put zero in there and solve. So I'm going to move this over. It's going to be a negative 20 uh, is equal to negative 15 t squared. And then I'm going to solve for t squared. t squared is negative 20 over negative 15. Uh, there. And so what you're going to get is t squared. So the negative divided by negative is positive, and then I can simplify this fraction, right? I can divide by 5. And so what I'll get is 4, and I'll divide by 5 here, which will be 3. Divide top and bottom by 4. And then negative divided by negative is positive. Now how do we get the time? We have to take the square root of both sides. So it'll be the plus or minus the square root of 4 thirds, right? Which, uh, as you all know, you can write that as plus or minus the square root of 4. The radical can apply to the top and the bottom. But what's really going on here is we have two answers, one positive in time and one negative in time. Now, we, we technically do have negative time in physics. Uh, it, it's not magical. It just means negative time is kind of like what would have happened before the experiment started, kind of. So time zero is when you start collecting the data, kind of like when you start looking, right? And as time goes on, then, then everything is changing and we're looking in the future, right? But when we get a negative value of time, it, it's not nonsense. It's just that basically if everything started the way we say it starts, then prior to the beginning of the experiment, there would be another time here prior to the beginning of the experiment where the velocity was also zero. But we don't typically care about that too much because uh, we're not even looking at the experiment until time is... Usually you set time zero when you begin to, to start the experiment. So yes, there's technically two values of time, but really we only care about the positive one. So I'm gonna say the positive one's the only one I care about. Square root of four is two, and I have a square root of three on the bottom. Now I know technically we don't like square root of threes on the bottom, but it doesn't matter because I'm gonna turn this thing into a decimal anyway. I'm gonna say that the time 
2 divided by the square root of 3 comes out to 1.15 seconds. So the question is, when is the velocity of this particle zero? Well, it turns out that uh, just over one second after the clock starts, the velocity of the particle is zero. Now, in the back of our mind, we know that there's another time, which is negative 1.15 seconds, where the time is where the velocity is also zero. And you could write it down, but, but we don't really care about things that happen before the experiment starts. You write it down if you want to, but it, it's kind of like non, it, does, it doesn't really have that much importance. All right, so let's take a look now at part B. Part B, when is the acceleration zero? So in order to find when the velocity was zero, we took the derivative and set it equal to zero. How do we find when the acceleration is zero? We're going to take the derivative of this to get the acceleration and set that equal to zero. So we know that the velocity, I'm just going to write it down, the velocity is 20 minus 15 t squared. How do we figure out the acceleration? The acceleration is dv, the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, which is just d dt of whatever this velocity is. I just stick it in here and it's going to be 20 minus 15 t squared. And so the acceleration, the derivative of any constant is zero, so I'm not even going to write it down. And then here, the 2 times the negative 15 is negative 30, and then the t is here, and the exponent gets reduced down by 1. So negative 30 times t. All right. So this is the acceleration, and to be more clear about it, instead of writing a, I'm going to write a as a function of time, because it's changing. The acceleration is not constant here. The acceleration is actually changing. Now later on in physics, we're going to study constant acceleration. Um, very, very in-depth, because it's actually very, very important. But in this case, we do not have constant acceleration. The acceleration itself is changing. Uh, you can see it because it has a time dependence in there. Um, so what we want to do is figure out when is this acceleration zero. So we put zero in here, negative 30 times t, and then you can say t is zero over negative 30 when you divide by this. And so what we have figured out is that the time is zero seconds, uh, the acceleration is zero. Time is zero, acceleration is zero. Time is 1.15 seconds, the velocity is zero. So the first part of the problem says, tell me when the velocity is zero. We calculated 1.15 seconds after the experiment starts, velocity is zero. Second part is, when is the acceleration zero? We calculate that right at the start of the experiment, there is no acceleration. The acceleration is zero. In other words, the we still have speed and position and all that, but we're not speeding up or slowing down right at the beginning of the experiment. The acceleration is zero. Now, part C says, when is the acceleration negative and positive? When is the acceleration negative or positive? So I'm going to label this part B, and I'm going to label this part C. So what we figured out is the acceleration is a function of time, and it's negative 30 times t. All right? So if I put zero in for time, I get zero acceleration, right? That's what I just said. But if I put uh, positive numbers in for time, then uh, if I put positive numbers in for time here, I get negative acceleration. So what I say is that a is less than zero, it's negative, I'll just put negative, when t is greater than zero. So this is kind of one of the answers. The acceleration is negative when t is greater than zero, because if I put positive numbers in here, I get negative, uh, positive times negative is negative. And also, the acceleration is greater than zero, positive, when t is less than zero. Make sure you agree with this. What if I put a negative number in for time before the experiment starts? Then uh, negative times negative is positive. So it turns out that uh, the acceler it's kind of backwards, the way this is sitting, uh, uh, shaping up here. Before the experiment starts, if you could go back in time and view it, the acceleration has to be positive, according to this. But after the uh, experiment starts, the acceleration flips negative. And right at the moment that the acceleration starts t0, uh, when the experiment starts, there is no acceleration at all. So we've calculated these things, but it's very difficult. You see how it starts getting confusing? When is it negative? When is it positive? Without a graph, things are very hard to do. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to plot each of these, and I've cheated a little bit, because I want to get it right, and I'm going to show you what these graphs look like. So, the position function, if we go back, was 20 times t minus 5t cubed. And that's what we plotted here, 20 times t minus 5t cubed. So this is a cubic, and if you remember, cubics have these weird S shapes, and that's exactly what we have here. So we have a situation where if you cover up everything before the experiment starts and just look in time, it gets farther and farther and farther away, 
Then it turns around and it comes back towards the origin and then it continues in the negative direction. Remember, this is one dimensional motion. So this is the position and this is the time. So really it's better to trace your finger. It's going here and then it turns around and then it goes back to the origin and then it goes negative. And then before time starts, then it goes negative and it turns around and goes positive again like this. So that's the position. Now we calculated the derivative of this thing and we said it was 20 minus 15 t squared, but he took the derivative of that and got the velocity. So here is a graph of the velocity and it's an upside down parabola because it's a quadratic t squared and there's a negative, uh, a negative coefficient on the t. So it's an upside down parabola. It shifted 20 units up. That's what the 20 is doing here. And so this is what it looks like. So before we look at the acceleration, let's see if any of this makes sense, okay? What we're saying is that as the particle, uh, I said that we don't care except for a positive time, but let's just pretend for a minute that the particle's here and it's flying through the origin. Now, it's going through the origin at a high rate of speed because you can see the position is changing very fast here. So right here is the maximum rate of speed as it crosses through the origin, and we see that it's going a maximum speed of 20 meters per second. But as it goes through the origin, eventually it slows down, and it turns around right here and starts to go the other way. So the velocity is going fast and slowing down, and it, velocity actually stops right here because the thing turns around. So you can see that as you go forward in time, the velocity is going down, 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 down. And I'm gonna tell you right now that I really, really, really wish I had graphed this with the same scale. The scale here is two, seconds plus minus two and the scale here is plus minus one and a half so this crossing point really corresponds to right here you can see it's just past the number one so what's going on is the velocity is zero right at the point that the particle turned around because it has to be zero in order to turn around and notice also that this time here 1.15 seconds is when we said the first part of the thing said, when is the velocity zero? We calculated at 1.15 seconds. We also said at negative 1.15 seconds, there was another time when the velocity was zero. And you can see it right here. Negative 1.15, positive 1.15, the velocity is zero. Both of these correspond to the two places where the, where the particle turned around. Here it was going up and it had to stop to turn around. And here it had to stop here and turn around so when the derivative was set equal to zero, you always find the maximum or a minimum of the curve. When you set the derivative, set it equal to zero, on the derivative graph, it corresponds to the crossing points when the velocity was zero. The maximum corresponds to right in between there because after it turned around, it starts covering ground fast. The highest rate of speed is here, and then it's immediately slowing down again. So here is when the velocity is the, the maximum there. All right, so that's position and velocity. What is the acceleration looking like? The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. And the acceleration looks like this. The acceleration looks like this. The acceleration is very uh, positive over here, and then it's negative over here. Let's see if we can understand why. Before time is zero, uh, the acceleration is going down, but it's still positive, right? And so what that means is that it's uh, basically starting to slow down. Even though I'm going up to a maximum of 20, every t everywhere before I get up here to the maximum point here, I am trying to, to arrest the velocity, is what I'm trying to do. I'm basically, yes, I'm going faster, but I'm slowing down uh, uh, I'm slowing down the rate of change of the velocity. I'm, I'm losing some uh, meters per second, if you wanna think of it that way, as I go up here. When I'm way over here at uh, negative one second over here, I, am, I have a uh, acceleration of 30 meters per second. You have to forgive me, I may have misspoke a minute ago, so just if, if, if it's a little confusing, let me try one more time here. In this region of time, I am speeding up, I'm gaining velocity the whole time, I'm increasing my velocity, so we know the acceleration is positive here. The slope of the line tangent here is positive, but the rate at which I am increasing that speed is going down, right? So I am accelerating the whole time, but the rate of my acceleration is going down. And that's what I see here. I have a positive acceleration here. So I'm speeding up, but the rate at which I'm doing the speeding up is, is itself slowing down. So right here, I'm not really speeding up or slowing down anymore. 
right here, I'm not speeding up or slowing down. I, mean, I still have a velocity, but I'm not increasing or decreasing my velocity at all at the very tippy top. And then this opposite thing happens over here. I'm, I'm basically uh, decelerating the whole time and I'm increasing the rate of my deceleration here. And so when I get over here, I'm, uh, this is a negative acceleration or a deceleration. And as time goes on, I'm subtracting more and more and more velocity here. So another way of looking at it is at the endpoints of here, I have maximum acceleration in the positive direction, maximum acceleration negatively. And so right here, I am maximally increasing my velocity over here, maximally decreasing my velocity over here. And as I get to the zero point in between them, I still have a velocity, but I'm not increasing or decreasing the velocity any, any, anywhere here. That's why it's a maximum uh, over there, which corresponds to having no acceleration. Like I said, it, it bends your brain into a noodle sometimes, and that's why you have to get the graphs. And even I, when I looked at this just now, I, I'm pretty sure I misspoke a minute ago and kind of interpreted it wrong. So you have position, the derivative or the slope of which is the velocity. The velocity, the, the slope of which becomes the acceleration. So whenever you, when you look at this, you can say, okay, I have maximum acceleration positive. I have maximum acceleration negative because the slopes are the maximums right here. And then here, the slope is zero, so no acceleration at all. And that corresponds to exactly what I have here. Maximum acceleration positive, maximum acceleration negative, no acceleration at all. So I'd like you to go through that. Uh, a couple of times if needed, draw it yourself, sketch it yourself, graph it yourself, and then follow me on to the last lesson. We'll, we'll solve our last problem in terms of just raw acceleration problems. And then after that, we will conquer the very important equations of motion when we have constant acceleration so we can calculate where a particle is going to be and all the, all the uh, uh, properties of the particle at any point in time, essentially, using those equations of motion. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.